Okay, thank you, everyone. So today we continue talking now about magnetic mirrors. Before getting there, um, some of you asked about the Lorentz equation integrator. And so I added a few slides um, on that as well, uh, as well as a word about uh, vacuum magnetic field solutions. So let's go through the Lorentz equation integrator fairly quickly. And as I mentioned before, this is a, a leapfrog implicit uh, integration scheme uh, of this form. <clears throat> and we're going to apply it to uh, the Lorentz equation. And so it's actually simply about putting the equation in terms that you can solve for this algorithm, <clears throat> for this equation with this algorithm, excuse me. Um, and so it's a little bit of vector algebra. So you start by uh, creating these normalized vectors. So in this case, omega, <clears throat> excuse me, and sigma are 3D vectors and they're uh, normalized um, as such in the Lorentz equation to get, <clears throat> excuse me, um, this scheme. And now we start discretizing the Lorentz equation uh, in the same way that we have here for the implicit method. And so we get this expression right here. And I've just copied it up here um, just for reference. But then if you create this new vector A, which is for convenience, if you will, to just reduce the algebra a little bit um, and replace it here, then you get something like this. If you perform, uh, if you cross A, so if you perform the cross product and then regroup, you get something like this, where now I've grouped all of this quantity on the right-hand side to some new vector called C. And if you dot the equation with A and also cross the equation, this, uh, this original equation, equation one, uh, with A as well, you get two expressions. You expand after using the um, usual A cross B cross C vector identity and insert it into equation two over here or excuse me, insert equation two into it, you get this expression here. So we're just doing vector algebra, which after solving, you get to this point. So you've now solved for the new step in the integrator, and that's the new step of the velocity. The particle position is simply um, x i, so the previous step plus the next step times your time step. So this is a, a very simple algorithm that can be implemented with a few lines of code. Um, I've used it to create the, the trajectories that I'm going to show here and that I showed in the previous presentation. Um, other programs are, of course, available. There's a lot of resources, actually, on um, from an organization called PlasmaPy. So it's a Python set of Python libraries um, with uh, application to plasma physics that you may download. Um, and, and I encourage you to visit it. It's all uh, open, open source, freely available. Um, I also was asked about the vacuum field solver. And uh, it's also relatively simple programming. Uh, it's really mostly knowing which expressions to put in, uh, and then a lot of summation. So if you start with um, the definition of magnetic flux and use uh, Stokes theorem to get to this point, uh, a contour integral of the vector potential, if you have a circular loop, then the only non-zero component of that vector potential is A phi which is constant along DL for a given 
so a, a differential of length in your contour for a given radius. The flux through a circular contour can be given in this way in terms of the vector potential. And then um, there's a really nice derivation in Jackson's uh, electrodynamics on, uh, on the vector potential for this case, uh, which you get here in terms of elliptical integrals, where the argument of the ellip elliptical function is uh, as shown here. And I'll be happy to share this uh, with you, of course, this expression. So you, you don't have to write it down now if you don't want to. But if you have questions, please feel free to ask. Um, and from the flux that you calculated, then you can get the components of the magnetic field as well. Uh, in my case, uh, I use the program Mathematica from Wolfram to calculate um, the flux and I approximate the elliptical integrals with these uh, polynomials that I found in a, in a mathema mathematics tables that I believe have worked really well. Um, and this that's because even though Mathematica has uh, elliptical integrals in it, um, I don't need the super high precision that Mathematica has. And sometimes it's difficult to dial it down. So this is a convenient and faster way to do it. Uh, you can also, of course, calculate the inductance of the loop um, or the or, or multiple loops um, by using the basic definition of, of inductance. And this is assuming the loop is a fixed conductor, of course. Then, then it becomes a, a, just a simple summation. As an example, um, I've put here a calculation that we did some time ago. Um, each little dot represents a loop of filamentary current uh, with this radius where the r equals zero axis is at the bottom of this rendering. And in this case, it's in meters, so it's almost uh, 0.75 meters or, also, or so uh, long, a machine. And you have four coils here. And so the program actually calculates the flux for each coil uh, for each winding, so you have thousands of turns here, and it also estimates the flux everywhere for, from all the coils. So you, you have just a series of summations here where you just offset the axial coordinate by some distance, uh, as well as the radial coordinate. And again, if you have uh, questions about this, please let me know. The Number of lines of code for this is very short. Um, and again, this is not the only vacuum field solver, but we just built our own um, so we know what's in it. So now going back to E cross B drifts and uh, centrifugal confinement. So last uh, presentation, I talked about drifts um, and how uh, and mirrors and uh, mu conservation or the first adiabatic conservation. It turns out that in mirrors, you get other quantities that are conserved. They're called second and third adiabatic invariants. And they have to do with the length of the bounds, um, as well as the drift that I talked about, the grad B and curvature drift that you naturally get in mirrors, even without any electric field applied. But also, I mentioned that the most important drift was the E cross B drift. So in a axisymmetric mirror, if you apply a radial electric field, then you'll start to get an azimuthal, meaning around the axis, drift, uh, just like it's shown here. And interestingly, again, even with a single particle, you start to get a, an idea of um, how it improves confinement. So the bounce length uh, is... Uh, reduced, and the loss cone uh, is also reduced. Now, if I start my simulation with a single particle at different radii and let it run for the same time, and I'm starting all particles with the same initial V parallel and V perp, and in this case, they are the same V parallel and V perp, and uh, again, parallel and perpendicular 
refer to the magnetic field. And I get that the angular velocity is not the same, and it depends on where you start in radius. So this already starts to hint at a shear flow that you can get um, in a rotating mirror, which again, it's advantageous to reduce radial losses. <clears throat> now, here's a little trick going from a single particle and pretending we have many particles. And again, this is just recasting the Lorentz equation in cylindrical coordinates, which I'm sure every, everyone here has done for some in, in your math and physics classes. And uh, using this expressions with the integrator that I mentioned. Um, now, before I continue, I want to mention that with this uh, simple integrator that I'm going to show, the simple numerical problem that I'm going to show, it uh, also demonstrates that even though E cross B drifts do not depend on charge and mass, that is only of the guiding center. If the electric field is large enough, um, this assumption doesn't hold perfectly. And then you start to get a dependence on charge and masses. I'm going to show. So assume you have a, a helium ion here. And I estimate for a certain density and temperature, the collision length, the mean free path before a collision can occur. And so I let it run for that length of time for that mean free path of that uh, particle energy. And then you get a collision and you randomize the direction of that collision, let it run again, you get a second collision and so on. If it gets to a certain radius, which I call the, the uh, chamber radius, we'll call that a recycling, the particle gets pushed in some distance away and then the process starts all over again. And if you do that many, many collisions, you can get a profile. And if you do that for different ions, for example, oxygen that is singly ionized, so called O2, um, you get a profile like this that is parabolic, it's not perfect because I guess I didn't let it run for long enough, but you get qualitatively a parabolic profile, which is what you will expect as I'll show in, a, in the com coming slides. Um, and if you do the same for carbon-3, so the mass of carbon-3, so doubly ionized, so it has um, two elementary charges missing, or if you have helium-2, which means it's singly ionized, and you get a fairly different uh, magnitude and profile of, uh, depending on the ion mass and, and charge. And the dotted lines he, he referred to actual measurements in the experiment that I'm gonna mention here too. <clears throat> anyway, as much as um, E cross B theory is useful, you always have to be careful to not take it as the ultimate word in what you're doing. Now we're gonna go, so going from one particle or one particle pretending to be many particles, and, and as in the case of multiple slides, we're going to go to now a large collection of particles, namely 10 to the 20 particles or more. Um, and we're going to use single fluid MHD. Um, and that is the simplest fluid model that we have in plasma physics. Um, it's very useful, it's not the most accurate, um, but because it's the simplest, it becomes very useful. And I'm going to go through some expressions uh, to show the applicability of single fluid MHD. Uh, first of all, you want time scales um, you take your time scale to be the cyclotron frequency, um, the length scale to be your Larmor radius, um, and you assume quasi-neutrality. Um, by by looking at the the bias shielding. So, for centrifugal mirrors, uh, 
it's beyond this talk to derive the expressions of a single fluid MHD, but it's a, a absolutely worthwhile exercise, of course, <clears throat> if you start from the Vlasov equation. But here, assume you've already gotten there and you have the uh, force balance equation. And for a magnetic mirror, you start um, with a gra pressure gradient, you have J cross V forces, and then you have, um, you assume for now that it's, it is collisional. And because this is applicable to laboratory experiments that we have performed and we're doing, but eventually collisionality uh, goes way down, but you also have um, viscosity. And this viscosity is important for the rotating mirror because shear flow that I mentioned with the single particle theory and that will appear in MHD um, creates heating. And that heating is important if you want to get to thermonuclear conditions. <clears throat> so for now, assume that you started the rotation. It's been going on for a while. So it's in steady state. So you can neglect the DMDT components. And if you look at the radial direction components, you have that the um, pressure gets balanced by the J cross B force in the radial direction minus this uh, losses um, radially. You also assume, we can assume that the radial flows um, are small compared to the azimuthal flows. So of course you're gonna have some losses radially out, but the velocity of, or the rate of those losses uh, shall be much more compared to the rate of rotation that you have. And let's do this simple transformation where the velocity is just R times the angular velocity and the azimuthal coordinate. And you can recast this expression again in this way here. And if you place um, this expression uh, that we just derived, we see that poloidal currents can balance the radial pressure profile as well as the centrifugal force. And radial currents balances the angular momentum loss to neutral collisions and viscous dissipation. In other words, when you're rotating, you have to keep adding power because if you stop the power, the rotation will wind down based on collisions uh, with neutrals and based on viscous dissip dissipation. As it's winding down, of course, uh, you can build up heat, but if you wanna keep it rotating in steady state, you have to keep adding power to it, uh, a current um, through the plasma or a J cross V times a velocity. Now, if we perform a volume integral in the above expression, we get the momentum confinement time, which um, goes as this expression, uh, which we'll come back to later. Now, if we look at the components along the magnetic field, so uh, until now we were concerned with the components that are radial and the radial transport. If we look at it along the magnetic field by dotting the expression from the previous page um, with B, then we drop this component, of course, by uh, simple vector algebra. Oh, excuse me. And again, assuming that axial flows are much smaller than your azimuthal flows, the expression reduces to this. And again, doing the transformation for the velocity with the radius uh, um, and the angular velocity. And the same transformation, again, I'm just copying it again here. And recall that pressure can be recast as NT or NKT if it's in SI units, but T is in EV, so it's just N NT. 
then we have this expression here. Now, you can note that this expression has already been uh, separated in terms of n. If now we, which is the number density, if we define the sound speed as such and replace here, we can now integrate this separable equation and evaluate at a certain R1 and R2 along a field line. So this, this is assuming that the temperature here um, is constant or inside your sound speed, the temperature is constant along a field line, which is considered a very reasonable assumption, even a few tens of EVs, uh, and even more so at hundreds or thousands of electron volts or KEVs. If you define the Mach number, that is the rotation velocity over the sound speed as such, then you can replace it here. You see that the pressure at the midplane here in the bulge of the mirror uh, is exponentially dependent on the Mach number uh, compared to the pressure here, which is what you want, right? You want most of your plasma to be confined in the center of your mirror, not at the mirror throat where it could escape. Now, this is um, because it's not, not always practical to measure R1 or R2, but we know we normally know what the field is. We impose the field, and so we know what the minimum and maximum are. We can recast um, this ratio of R1 and R2 in terms of what's called the mirror ratio, which is just the ratio of the maximum over the minimum of the field. And so you end up with this expression right here. So you can see that even for moderate mirror ratios, and by moderate, I mean, say, 5 to 10, um, this is mostly dependent. The exponent in the exponential expression is mostly dependent on the square of the uh, Mach number. In other words, you get a 1 over R dependent on the mirror ratio. So a super high mirror ratio doesn't buy you much compared to a moderate mirror ratio, which is good news because uh, making uh, magnetic fields is very expensive. Um, it also, this expression also shows that with fast enough rotation, you can effectively close the uh, mirror losses or through the loss cone. Now, simulations have been performed. You know, these simulations have been uh, around for, for many years now, but they essentially confirm what we just saw with single particle um, approximation and uh, with the analytical expressions, where you get most of your pressure here. The, the mirror is just oriented vertical. Um, I am. Never sure why they do this when they uh, perform simulations, but okay. And the angular velocity uh, shows that it's isorotating in any given flux surface. So a flux surface, if you imagine as a shell, if you're um, on that flux surface, then the rotation anywhere on that surface has the same angular velocity. But if you move to the next flux surface, the angular velocity changes and Indeed, it has a profile that is more or less parabolic. Um, and that also gives you a pressure profile that is parabolic. And that this is, of course, again, advantageous because it can help destroy interchange modes, like I'm going to show in the next slide. So this is another simulation where the plasma pressure in a mirror without rotation, so this is a traditional mirror, um, was let left to increase to a high enough value that you get this so-called flute modes or flutes. So this is just a slice of your mirror. Uh, flutes are essentially Rayleigh-Taylor-like instabilities where you have a heavier in Rayleigh-Taylor instability. You have a heavy fluid uh, on top of a lighter fluid. 
and the heavy fluid wants to go down, the lighter fluid wants to go up, and you start to get this um, kind of mushrooms that are formed, at least in, in a 3D space, in a mirror, because you have the magnetic field creating a, a sort of tension, instead of uh, bubbles, what you get are flutes, essentially 2D uh, bubbles, if you will. And they very quickly can remove uh, your confined hot particles. Um, and then to replace those hot particles, you bring in cold particles. And essentially, for a traditional mirror, you can never get to thermonuclear conditions um, with this interchange. That is, a, that is a fundamental issue with just a traditional mirror without rotation. Now, in this simulation, if you grab this last panel as the initial condition, and now you turn on the rotation, you can see that immediately because of E cross V drift and because of shear flow, you start to stabilize that interchange mode until after some time, uh, it becomes fully stable. Now, the caveat is that this interchange modes, yes. Is, is like a what, sorry? Uh huh. Because here we have only plasma. So, and you said that one hot and one cold. Ah, yes. Uh, it's, it's the analogy. Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, it's the analogy that I used, but in reality, there's a pressure. Um, the magnetic field has its own pressure, uh, B squared over 2 mu naught, right? That's the magnetic field pressure. And the plasma has a thermal pressure, NKT. And ideally, you will expect that they balance out, right? When the pressures are the same, they balance out. As it happens in plasma, with plasmas, uh, it's not really like a, the, the magnetic field is not like a solid wall. It's more like trying to uh, confine, uh, say, jello or something that is very viscous and, and can flow through a spring, like, like a, a slinky, say. Um, the stronger the magnetic field, the more turns per unit length you will have in this uh, configuration, right? But uh, anyway, it's an imperfect uh, confinement scheme. The magnetic field is not perfectly, uh, it's not like a solid wall. Uh, but in the analogy of the Rayleigh-Taylor instability, the magnetic field will be um, the heavy fluid. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the plasma will be the heavy fluid. The magnetic field will, will be the light fluid, if you will. Um, so the, the hot plasma just pushes through the magnetic field and the magnetic, magnetic field has to rearrange itself to let the plasma through, as you see in the left uh, panel. But fortunately, uh, with the E cross B rotation, you naturally get a shear flow, um, which is which is what you want. Again, these flutes can snap out, can can grow, and and move plasma um, very quickly in the at, at the speed of sound, essentially. So if you're rotating supersonically, then you have a chance to shear those flutes out and and train any of that plasma that wanted to move out into the azimuthal direction, and now you the plasma never made it outside. And so that's um, that's what the E cross B rotation is, is helping you with. Uh, yes, it can, um, but we don't think it does, uh, experimentally and numerically. Um, the, there's, I, I don't have it here, but there's another uh, instability called the Kelvin Helmholtz instability. Uh, yeah, um, oh, yes, I'm sorry. I, I, I thought you were talking about chaos. Uh, uh, yes, that's right. Um, I don't have it in my presentation, but I'll refer you to a paper by Professor Adil Hassam and one of his students where they looked at that problem and they, they determined that it will not happen in this configuration. That, that's correct. Now, according to this theory, if you scale it up to thermonuclear conditions, and thermonuclear conditions really mean that you have to um, 
comply with the Lawson criterion that you've heard here or have enough particles confined for long enough um, at a high enough temperature to start thermonuclear fusion, right? Um, which here it means, you know, very hot plasmas. Now, this um, confinement time for the radio losses is uh, essentially a, a Braginsky expression, and it's a, assumed a classical uh, diffusion, which is has always been for all plasmas has always been um, very optimistic, and that is part of what why we're doing experiments that I'll mention in a moment. Um, in the parallel direction, uh, electrons are a lot more mobile and they can escape until there's a potential that is formed that is a Pastukov uh, potential that helps keep them in there. Um, but the in order to have thermonuclear confinement with a centrifugal mirror, you need to have, as I mentioned, supersonic um, rotating velocities. And the hotter your plasma, the higher the rotation velocity. And so it's estimated that you need on the order of a Mach number of six, so uh, six times the speed of sound in the plasma. Um, and to impose that rotation, so let me go here. So like, well, how exactly do you impose a radial electric field? So a simple way to do it is just to put an electrode in the center of your configuration, bias it to a high voltage, and that gives you a radial electric field. Um, and obviously have a magnetic field, uh, a traditional mirror like we've discussed, and that will give you the rotation. Um, there's something else that you have to have in order to support uh, voltage drop between flux surfaces. So let that electric field propagate through. Your flux surfaces cannot uh, touch a metal because otherwise you will short them. So if you have a voltage in one flux surface, again, we assume that the temperature is the same and it's reasonable to expect that the voltage in that temperature will also be the same so long as you can have that flux surface electrically isolated from its neighbors, from its adjacent flux surfaces, or really from any other flux surface. In order to do that, you have to have insulators. Um, so in terms of practical engineering of a reactor, both a center electrode immersed in a high temperature plasma and insulators are a challenge. Um, but you know, you you never get anything for free. So there's always some some uh, problems you will have to solve both in physics and in engineering. But this is basically what you need to do. You need to have um, some way to impose the electric field and some way to prevent the magnetic flux lines or, or uh, flux surfaces from shorting so they can support an electric field. Oh, they can form a closed loop. Ah, because, well, you need to have a pressure, you need to have a chamber, a vacuum chamber where you sustain your plasma, right? Because it needs to be, you want as high pressure as possible, but it won't be atmospheric pressure. And even if you had um, atmospheric pressure, or if you did it, say, in outer space, where you could inject the gas and keep it there, etc., cetera, um, you still need a mechanical support structure for your coils uh, somehow. So the you don't want the field lines to intercept mechanical structures. Um, and on Earth, uh, the truth is we need, you know, densities of say 10 to the 20, but air densities are what, 10 to the 25, 10 to the 26. So it's actually, even when you have a plasma there, you still have a fairly high vacuum. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this in terms of engineering, you know, you, you still need essentially a, a vacuum chamber. Um, and those are typically made out of metal. Um, it's, you know, the, the safest is what you can get easiest, but you don't want the field lines to intercept those metal surfaces. Oh, they, they, the, the field lines go outside. You know, I, the cartoon stops here, but these field lines do go all the way around, of course. You know, you, you still have to meet Gauss's law. <laughs> 
you know, you still have to comply um, with council's law. So the, there's field lines, and of course there are field lines everywhere here, right? They're they're going on the sides of the chamber. Um, they're going everywhere and, and all the way around the magnets. Um, that is okay, but where you want the rotating plasma, it's only a reduced number of field lines. And I, I'll, I'll talk about that more in a moment. In fact, there are of course field lines or flux surfaces here as well, but you may have plasma there, but it's not rotating. And so you don't expect hot plasma there. Now, a simple way to power the discharge to, to apply a high voltage and, and let it rotate. Well, if you have a, um, it's a DC uh, electric field. You don't need a, a, a oscillating electric field. Um, engineering wise, that actually is more challenging. You know, DC fields are more challenging than, than oscillating fields because all the power that we get from, from the wall is, is uh, oscillating, right? Um, so you have to rectify it. You have to make sure you know it, it, it has a low ripple, etc. Or you could also use capacitors. And traditionally, we have used capacitors because plasmas take a lot of energy. First of all, just to ionize them, to produce them, and then to support them, they typically get take um, high power. You know, anywhere from hundreds of kilowatts to many megawatts. And depending on the experiment, you know, not just for rotating mirrors. It could be hundreds of megawatts, right, to, to support, which is um, very high for any laboratory where you will do this. <clears throat> but capacitors have no problem delivering that type of power, uh, although, of course, for a short time, which is usually long enough, uh, many MHD times, so you can do experiments. So the basic circuit will be like this, where you charge your capacitor with a separate circuit. Mm -hmm. You open the switch on the left-hand side so you don't destroy your charging supply. And then when you're ready to take the discharge, you close the switch. Um, that starts the discharge and at the same time imposes the electric field that gets it to rotate. And um, we'll see some traces in a moment, but you can model the plasma. Uh, as a, 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 again, just looking at the electrical engineering, as a capacitor and a resistor, and you say, well, uh, a capacitor, how is that, how, how can that be? And if you look at the stored energy in a capacitor, you of course have the stored energy in your capacitor bank, so you know how much energy you start with. And you look at the stored energy, just assume that the plasma uh, is a capacitor because it's in a cylindrical chamber, but because it's rotating, there's some stored energy in the rotation as well. If you equal those two, you get to this expression and assuming the rotation velocity is VP, which is the plasma voltage over a distance. So V, uh, you know, the, it's the electric field over V, that's the magnitude of the rotating, um, the velocity of ro rotating plasma. And this is of course an average velocity just for the sake of calculation. And you get to this expression. Um, I don't have it in these slides, but you can get to capacitance by looking at the, pla the chamber and the um, center electrode as a cylindrical capacitor, calculating the capacitor from capacitance from that, and then using the dielectric of the plasma to calculate how much charge you could store uh, throughout. And they're not exactly the same, but they're similar, the, the two values that you could get from here. Now, something else that you get in rotating plasmas is what's called diamagnetic currents. It turns out, again, starting from the momentum confinement equation, and we're right now disregarding the collision losses um, and, and any viscous heating. So we're simplifying this just for the sake of argument here. And if you dot the expression uh, with B, to look at the component that's aligned to the magnetic field and assume the magnetic field has this um, form like we've seen uh, before actually, where psi is a flux function, then you can express 
the component perpendicular to the field as this, which is called the grad Shafranov equation. Um, and it includes uh, azimuthal flows. Here, dp and dip psi, so it's um, the pressure perpendicular to the magnetic field or orthogonal to the magnetic field. Um, this assumption, this expression here is what I showed in the other slides, it's, except instead of using n, we use uh, rho for the density of the plasma, but it's, it's essentially the same expression that I showed you before. Uh, it, it shows the exponential dependence. We can replace this by the Mach number, et cetera, but linearizing this expression um, gets you to what's called the diamagnetic currents, essentially how the flux changes when you have just plasma pressure. So in a mirror without rotation, the plasma pressure will tend to bow the field lines a little bit, thus creating essentially the equivalent of diamagnetic currents. But then when you have the plasma rotating, that creates even more pressure outwards. So the diamagnetic currents are, are even bigger. This is from a paper for a, from a student uh, that worked at Maryland uh, a while ago. And this shows his calculations of uh, diamagnetic currents where you start zero is your vacuum field and 1.5 Weber's is what you will get just from a certain plasma pressure. And if you have it rotating, your diamagnetic currents become significantly more and they're modified because the plasma is not nearly as distributed along the field, uh, along the magnetic mirror. So anyway, diamagnetic currents are, are important to uh, take into account as well. Now, this is the experiment that was done more than 10 years ago, um, which essentially was a long mirror machine with insulators here. They're, here they're shown as little plates and a center conductor that imposed uh, uh, high voltage. And these are the parameters that it achieved central fields of anywhere it could be controlled, you know, from zero to 0.2 or maybe maybe more than that, um, but the coils couldn't support much higher than that. The mirror field, the strongest field, Vmax, will go to typically 1.8, maybe a little bit more than that sometimes. So if you get the ratio of these two, you could get mirror ratios of 10 with this sort of fields or more, of course, if you lowered uh, the mid-plane field, but you didn't really want to do. Confinement times of, you know, two, 300 microseconds. And it demonstrated supersonic rotation with rotation velocities of more than 100 kilometers per second. The capacitor bank that was used was 1.7 millifarads. Using the expression that I showed a couple of slides back, um, you get plasma capacitances of on the order of 100 microfarads. Excuse me. Uh, oh, I'll show I'll show that in a moment. But it was also uh, almost in equilibrium with ion with ion temperature. So experimentally, we've managed to demonstrate the hallmarks of the theory that I showed that is uh, centrifugal confinement, uh, which is a significant improvement from just a, a mirror confinement without rotation, and uh, supersonic rotation that was measured um, with uh, ion Doppler spectroscopy, as well as just looking at the voltage. If you measure the voltage that you have across the plasma, you know the, the radius extent of the plasma and you know the magnetic field. So you can calculate the average E over B um, or, or E cross B velocity, the magnitude of E cross B over B squared is just E over B. So you can calculate the magnitude of that velocity, which again, confirms that it's uh, supersonic. These results were uh, checked for a variety of mirror ratios. 
uh, which you have here in this kind of funny way, um, in, in the Maryland centrifugal experiment, thus confirming that the density that you should be getting, this exponential dependence, uh, follows the theory. So again, even though single fluid MHD is the coarsest, the less precise fluid theory that we have in plasmas, um, it is fairly adequate for uh, modeling the mirror. We used uh, uh, spectroscopy as well to look at, again, Doppler spectroscopy, but also to look at what impurities we had um, in the system. We used high-speed imaging to, to be able to tell at different times what was happening, the, the, um, capture the velocity in time. And um, we were able to put many cords that is uh, have multiple views on the same image. We only had one camera. These cameras are very expensive. So we only had one camera. So we, we made, we commissioned a fiber, um, uh, fused fiber system where you had many optical fibers going into a, a single fiber that was attached to the spectroscope. And in one image, you could get the information from up to 10 fibers. Then you could use, if you arrange your fibers in this radial way, you could get a profile uh, for velocity and temperature um, up to a point, right? Uh, if, you're, if you're using hydrogen and it's ionized, then you get no atomic line emission, of course. But if you see the little bit of helium, then helium doesn't, it, it, it's harder to ionize. So you get signals that are weak. They're not very strong, um, but you can tell uh, the, the Doppler broadening, uh, you, you, can get, you can get Doppler shift, et cetera, from those uh, seed helium. And the mass of helium is the closest you can get to hydrogen, of course. Uh, so that's why we use helium. The voltage and current normally will look very quiescent, but as we started to get hotter and hotter, it started to show this high frequency and low and I call low frequency components, which are here. Um, and we think that's an instability. You also get, you can also decompose um, the rotation in Fourier modes, just like you've seen in other components. And um, we think we had uh, two modes beating. Say, imagine you had a flat tire with holes or nails in two different places. And as you're running your car, you hear a doo -doo, doo -doo, something like that, uh, which was confirmed using B dot probes that were all around the machine uh, recording the rotation. But even with this um, modes or these instabilities, and again, taking a, a, a fast Fourier transform of this, you get that there's components, what I call the low frequency side in the, a few kilohertz to a few tens of kilohertz. Then it, you go up to 300 or so kilohertz, and then they become significant again. And I believe that the high frequency ones, the hundreds of kilohertz ones, are because of plasma neutral interactions. Um, and the low frequency ones are these uh, beating modes that I, that I mentioned. We managed to see how during these modes, you get a lot of plasma expulsion. And you can look at the, with the high speed image, we had to put mirrors and so on because our camera couldn't be too close to the, the electromagnets. You can see the cone where the plasma is rotating. That's where it looks the brightest. And you do have some plasma outside of it, but again, it's fairly well defined. But the shape of this cone, the width of this cone, if you will, will vary with time and, and we could never confirm that it was at the frequency of the burst, uh, but it happened many times during a shot for sure. And this is just a way to know where the, the to measure the width of these cones that I talked about. Anyway, if you, um, oh, excuse me. If you integrate over many bursts, 
then it gets fuzzy, but also the cones are um, equal between more equal between times, which is which indicates that the bursts are fairly high frequency uh, compared to the length of the shot. I won't spend much time here because we're running out of time, but uh, one of the conjectures is that this mode, there was some drag of the rotation at some place that creates field dragging. In other words, it starts to pull the magnetic field with it, the magnetic field lines, which in turn creates E cross V drifts axially. Those could go to the center, but it could also go outside. Um, but because that's not sustainable, at some point, the system has to reset itself. And that was probably done by expelling plasma. And then you could build it up again. And this may happen many times over. So this, this was a, a, a conjecture that we published. Um, we never had time to be absolutely sure of it in this experiment. But there's something else called the critical ionization velocity. And that critical ionization velocity is uh, was conjectured by, by Alfain as an instability whereby if you're uh, rotating or you're pushing plasma across magnetic field lines, the, the, the velocity at which you can push the plasma will be limited by the ionization potential of the plasma. Um, he was uh, Alfain was trying to explain planetary formation with this. Uh, but if applied to the rotating mirror, essentially says that the kinetic energy that you, that particles can have, that ions can have in your plasma is limited in the case of hydrogen by the ionization potential of hydrogen, which uh, actually gives you a velocity of 50.9 kilometers per second. Um, and that is mapped throughout the flux surfaces. In other words, the limitation of 50.9 kilometers per second is the linear velocity that you can get here at the insulators, which is where you have the highest density, where you have the coldest plasma, the highest density of neutrals, I should say, the coldest plasma, et cetera. Um, and because we said that you need solid angular velocity rotation, so the angular velocity is the same in a given flux surface, well, that gives you a velocity that is higher than 50 kilometers per second if you map it here, but it could still be below um, the CIV limit, which in this case was 134 kilometers per second. Um, for many years, we couldn't go past the CIV limit because the plasmas were over dense. The machine was too dirty, meaning it had a lot of impurities, um, which gets you to radiate power away, which gets you to reduce the kinetic energy that you have. Um, but eventually with a lot of effort, uh, cleaning, you know, changing the culture of how we do experiments. And every time we opened the machine, we literally cleaned everything as much as we could. That actually helped. And eventually we were able to overcome the CIV limit in that machine. Um, even if it was for a few, uh, for a fraction of a millisecond. Uh, and then it went back down to being below the CIV limit. Again, this is this is what I just uh, explained, where you equate the velocity of the particle, the kinetic energy of the particle, to the ionization potential. And this is a summary of results. You start with this is the angular velocity along a, the same flux surface, and you start with everything the same. We we could never tell what was going on here. Uh, the linear velocity can, of course, be different because you are rotating at a different radii with the same angular velocity. And the temperature, this is only for ions, was measured, uh, again, to at least 100 eV, which was uh, fantastic. But you can see the error bars indicate that some measurements were done at uh, even 200 eV, which, uh, again, for us was a big deal. You can tell here that at, at some point it looks like the Angular velocity seems to start to change. And you say, aha, that's the measurement that you were talking about to get this field dragging. That's, this is probably not what that is because of diamagnetic currents. So the, the ion Doppler spectrometer was fixed in space. But because of diamagnetic currents, the flux surfaces will expand. So they actually shift 
with respect to the view of the ion Doppler spectrometer, and then you could get the impression that you're rotating differentially. But in reality, you may be rotating at the same velocity. Your your uh, Doppler spectrometer just didn't adapt essentially, didn't change th throughout the shot. So that was 10 years ago. Now we have an experiment that we literally just closed uh, a few weeks ago and we started vacuum and starting plas plasma tests and so on. This is the first superconducting rotating mirror experiment. Um, the superconductors, we you know finally had enough budget to buy them, but then we realized we didn't have the budget to buy custom-made superconductors. So we ended up buying used medical magnets, MRI magnets, stripping them down, taking all the you know medical stuff and the RF coils because we're not doing magnetic resonance experiments. We're just we just want the magnetic field from them, which actually, if you ever go to a hospital and get an MRI, the tunnel is very, very slim, mainly because you have to have all these RF coils and, and so on and, and the plastic to make it look nice. If you take all that out, the bore is actually almost 90 centimeters or, or a little bit more than 90 centimeters. And, and so we used as much of, as the bore as we could and put a simple cylindrical chamber. So we learned a few lessons from the previous experiment on how to minimize plasma surface interactions, which we believe were a big problem before. The machine itself is longer. So I have both MCX and what's called CMFX, the centrifugal, centrifugal mirror fusion experiment here. The machine itself is longer which is advantageous again to, to minimize interactions from neutrals. Um, and we have better control where the current from the imposed high voltage and the current that goes across the magnetic field where it grounds. Um, and the fact that the, the mirror here, the mirror throat is long, it's just a consequence of the medical magnets. We didn't really need it to be this long, um, but that's what we get. Of course, the field is stronger because medical magnets typically have three Teslas. Um, and at the mid plane field, we have right now we have 0.35 Tesla, which is um, more than 50% of what we had before. And, and trust me, that makes a big difference in experiments. Just any small gain that you can get at the mid plane of the mirror uh, is advantageous. But concomitantly with that, you have to add a higher voltage. So the stronger your field is better for confinement, but then you need a higher voltage, which engineering wise is more challenging. We made um, the machine such that we could, we could control the mirror ratio. This is not easy to do, but uh, because we have to open the machine, change, the limiters, which are rings essentially. Um, so it's a, it's a big disruption. Right now we're starting with the slimmer limiters because that gets you to have, this is the A parameter that I mentioned before of, of B over A, which is right here. That gets you to require a lower voltage to get a high velocity, you know, when A is small. Um, again, you may say, well, just make B small because it's in the denominator that will also give you a high velocity of rotation. But if you go back to the single particle theory, your the Larmor radius becomes too large. Um, and then that becomes a problem because it starts to be more non-MHD. And even if you say, well, I'll just throw all my computer resources at it uh, for the modeling, you still get uh, a disfavorable uh, conditions for confinement. So anyway, we'll we will test in the future at least two of these conditions. But then something that we really need to test is the um, radial confinement. Essentially, what, what type of transport do we really have in the past for MCX? So these are expressions that have been assumed in publications that we've sent out, actually, even before I started working in the mirror, Professor Adil Kassan published this. Again, this Braginsky uh, uh, classical type confinement, which is, of course, very optimistic. Um, it gives you curves that look like this. These are logarithmic plots. Um, and so you can see that they vary by several orders of magnitude, depending on where you are in the applied voltage, the magnetic field, 
but also I need to point out that most of the power goes in the rotation. Um, in MCX, the experiment that I uh, mentioned before, we were able to only test, this is for a reactor, let me show, um, for CMFX. In MCX, in the previous experiment, we were only able to test conditions way down here. So we're going to impose much higher voltages to test these curves at, you know, at 50 to 100 kilovolts in this case. If this works or whatever we get, we'll be able to inform whether we could project this to a reactor scenario. Even with a pessimistic scenario, you still get Q greater than one. In the case of very optimistic scenario, you get Q, Q scientific, which you've seen before, the power that you get out of the fusion energy over the power you have to put in of you know, more than 200 for, for magnetic fields, center fields that are for Tesla, which are perfectly possible today uh, with radii of two meters or so. That is super optimistic. You know, I created these plots. Um, I have a hard time believing them. So that's why we're doing the experiments to get a better handle of, on reality of this, on the reality of this. Um, I'll skip to this. Uh, again, the machine is running. Uh, I, we're almost out of, actually, we're out of time. I just want to mention that if you're pursuing fusion energy, you have to worry about how much the thing's going to be and how much it's going to be, even after you learn to make it, even after you are churning them out in steady state on your production plant, et cetera, you still want to know how much the thing's going to cost. Even if you manage to produce beautiful confinement, if the machine is so expensive uh, that no one's going to want to buy it, no one's going to want to give you the money up front or give you a loan even to pay it over many years, then it's not a very useful concept. On there, the scenarios that uh, we've modeled it, uh, we received funding to pay a company actually to do the costing study for a projection to a reactor for the centrifugal mirror. And assuming a much more, um, excuse me, moderate Q of 20 or 21, we get very encouraging results, um, power, uh, electricity costs that will be very competitive. And this takes into account the cost of the magnets, the cost of the machine, assuming a certain downtime, uh, um, the cost of the leasing the land, et, et cetera, um, and all the auxiliary systems that you will have to have for a power plant, it indicates that it will be a, a, a cost-effective machine. Now, there's of course right now a huge range of values that we will have here. And hopefully with the experiments we're doing now and with future experiments, we'll be able to narrow down um, these projected Q values. So I'll stop there. Thank you, everyone. Maybe one question. Yeah. So for ions, it effectively eliminates the ion losses. Electrons can still escape. Um, it helps, but it, it can still escape until you build uh, enough of a potential, this plastic of potential, to prevent them from, from escaping. But for ions, it's effectively close. And, and actually that difference between electrons and ions is what helps you uh, build up this potential very quickly and also stop uh, parallel losses from electrons. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I want to know something uh, the diagrams. Uh, is, there, is there a diagram for electrons or something in other kind of for uh, The diagram for what? Excuse me? Your slide. Uh huh. There is a diagram that demonstrates an uh, experiment for the uh, drifts. Drift you, you mean? The beginnings. You mean this curves here? No, at the beginning of your presentation. Oh, the beginning. Okay, well, <laughs> I'll get there. Yeah, here, here, down, 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 down. down. 
Yeah, here. Here? Yeah. Uh, here we have seen that what is the goal of the elite for? Is that for just for a uh, lighter big accelerator or a kind of? Oh, um, the electrode is you bias the center electrode to impose um, the voltage that gives you the radial electric field. Uh, the line here indicates that your machine is the ground. So you have to, the, the potential differences between the center electrode um, and the cylindrical shell that you have. In, in this case, it's a, again, it's a simplified diagram. It turns out that this is terrible for plasma surface interactions. You don't want this type of, of uh, flat field here. You're, you're just maximizing your plasma surface interactions, which then take away a lot of your energy, your, your rotation energy. And so this is a cartoon, but it's not a, a good confinement shape, if you will. Another thing here is that uh, in the top of the board, there is a grid velocity. And here uh, at the bottom, there is things and just we have uh, like the, this kind of motion for a particle of uh, in addition to that of the drift, mirror drift, there is like cycle bonds and things like that. Um, yeah, this is just showing the guiding center drift, right? Like just the general direction of the plasma drift. Yes, you for um, individual particles, you will have that gyro motion that I showed before. Um, but that doesn't stay on for long because eventually, even in a collisionless plasma, eventually those that motion will change direction. You'll get a few more trichoidal orbits, et cetera. Is that what you're asking? This this curve here is just showing the guiding center. So, uh, so maybe you can pursue this. Uh, yeah, we can we can talk offline if you want. We have to get started. So, right. Yeah. We can leave now. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. No, you need to stop recording, restart it. Otherwise, that would not be good.